By about 7.40 a.m., the rearming operations had been underway for about half an hour. Karga and Akagi's first Chutai of Type 97s, 9 and 6 planes respectively, were both nearing the end of the rearming process, leaving two more Chutai to go on each ship. Both ships of Carrier Division 1 was also currently holding a course into the wind in order to bring on board additional fighters. Suddenly, in the midst of these proceedings, came a bolt from the blue. Tone's number four scout plane sent the following report. Sight what appears to be ten enemy surface units, in position bearing ten degrees distance 240 miles from Midway. Course 150 degrees, speed over 20 knots. This was a stunning development, because it stood every assumption of Yamamoto's plan on its head. Nagumo and his staff quickly huddled to discuss the implications. It is important to clarify the exact delivery time of Tone No. 4's message to the Bridge of Akagi, because this matter has been subjected to great scrutiny. Nagumo's composite log indicates that the original signal was transmitted to Tone at 7.28 a.m. It may well be that Amari had spotted the Americans sometime before this. It was the practice of Japanese search aircraft to work their way around the perimeter of an enemy formation before transmitting. Doing so would hopefully confuse the enemy as to the actual bearing back to the carrier force once the scout breached radio silence. As a result, we cannot know the exact time that Amari actually sighted the American force, only when he transmitted. It has generally been supposed that Amari's transmission made it up to Akagi's bridge sometime before 7.45 a.m. This is because Nagumo's battle report logs an order at that time to reverse the earlier rearming order and to leave torpedoes on those attack planes which have not as yet been changed to bombs. However, at least one contemporary historian, Dallas Isom, has asserted that Nagumo actually did not receive Amari's transmission until 8 a.m. or later. As part of this theory, it has been proposed that Nagumo's orders to reverse arming may have been misrecorded in the composite log that forms the basis of the Nagumo report. This notion is vaguely supported by Nagumo's own statement in the summary section of his report that Tona No. 4's message was not received until about 8 a.m. and is repeated in other Japanese materials as well. However, in this particular case, it is clear that Nagumo did receive Amari's transmission about the same time it was logged in the Nagumo report. Furthermore, Nagumo thereupon acted on this information with great alacrity, this is confirmed not by Japanese sources, but by those of the enemy. At 7.40 a.m., American radio intelligence logged Amari's third message of his flight thus far, reporting the initial sighting of the Americans. More important, American signals intelligence on Hawaii also noted a return transmission from Akagi at 7.47 a.m., requesting that tone number four retain contact. Surprisingly, this signal was sent in the clear, without being encoded. The impression one gets is that Nagumo was quite concerned at Amari's sighting report, enough so that the need for a speedy response to his scout apparently outweighed any need for signal security. Thus, the theory that Nagumo experienced a delay in receiving tone number four's message cannot be supported. Likewise, it is clear that Nagumo did not dawdle in his deliberations upon receiving Amari's message. He immediately reversed his arming orders and then promptly asked for clarification from his scout regarding what had been seen. However, Isom is quite correct in noting that Tone No. 4's detection of Task Force 16 at 7.28 a.m. was one of the few pieces of good luck that Nagumo was to receive that day. On the face of it, this seems an incredible statement. After all, Tone No. 4's tardiness in taking off has commonly been held up as one of the crucial Japanese failures during the battle. Yet, a careful examination of the American course tracks overlaid by the original Japanese search pattern provides an important revelation. Had Amari been launched promptly at 4.30 a.m. and actually flown his route as prescribed in the original search plan, he would have flown well south of both American formations on his outbound route and would not have detected them until the inbound leg. This would have delayed his likely detection time until at least 8 a.m., meaning that Nagumo, in turn, would probably not have had an initial report in hand until closer to 8.15 a.m. or later. Not only that, but had Amari actually flown his prescribed route after his delayed launch, 
the situation would have been made worse still. It was only Amari's unauthorised truncation of his search pattern, or perhaps muddled navigation, coupled with his apparent decision to dogleg north at around 6.45am, that put him in a position to make his initial sighting report badly flawed, though it was. The question then remains, what should Nagumo have done at this time? Finding the right answer to Nagumo's conundrum if such an event exists has consumed endless gallons of ink over the years. Much of it, regrettably, has been spilled to little purpose. For without having a clear grasp of what the actual state of the Japanese force was, and what was and was not possible for their carriers in the way of operations, a meaningful analysis of Nagumo's options cannot be constructed. Since this was perhaps the critical point in the battle for Nagumo, it's worth spending the time to lay these issues out in detail. Nagumo's command decisions were governed by three primary constraints. The first was time. It's worth remembering at this juncture, reading at our leisure decades later in the quiet of a library or our own home. Nagumo had approximately 15 minutes to find the correct solution to a set of operational problems whose outlines because of the spotty intelligence endemic to this morning's actions he only partially grasped. The second constraint was the physical arrangement of Akagi's bridge. Unlike us, Nagumo wasn't parked in an easy chair. Indeed, a factor that has been entirely overlooked until now is the nature of Akagi's command facilities and the effect these likely had on the Admiral's ability to reason clearly. Akagi's bridge was a tiny trapezoid, some 15 feet wide and 12 feet long, containing little more than a small map table, a chart locker, and several sets of pedestal-mounted spotting binoculars, it was extraordinarily cramped. In this tiny space stood at least five officers, Nagumo, Kusaka, Genda, Captain Aoki, and Akagi's navigator, Commander Miura. In addition, if Fuchida's account is to be believed, several other individuals were present at least some of the time as well, Captain Oishi, Kusaka's senior staff member, Lieutenant Commander Ono, staff intelligence officer and Lieutenant Commander Nishibayashi, Staff Flag Secretary, Commander Masuda, Akagi's Hikocho, and Fuchida himself. Of these, Oishi and Ono appear to have been present at all times. Fuchida apparently came and went at various points during the morning, and Nishibayashi was likely doing the same. Commander Masuda would perforce have been spending much of his time on the air control platform on the aft end of the island, one level lower, but would have been coming up to the bridge periodically to report to Captain Aoki on the state of air operations. In addition, a minimum of several enlisted personnel was required on the bridge for lookout duty and running messages. Taken together, it's difficult to imagine that there were fewer than a dozen individuals in the command spaces almost constantly. The men had to have been standing practically shoulder to shoulder, with Nagumo and his staff crammed into the starboard half of the bridge. Nagumo was unlikely to be able to give or receive candid opinions from his staff in such a setting. The Japanese, as a rule, do not like interpersonal confrontations and tend to shun uncomfortable social situations. Kusaka and Genda were undoubtedly sensitive to the fact that Nagumo was not as well versed in naval aviation matters as he needed to be. Yet, in such a setting, they probably would have been unwilling to make the full extent of their own knowledge known because that would risk embarrassing their commander in front of Captain Aoki and the ship's crew. Nagumo, for his part, would certainly not have wanted to reveal his own shortcomings in these matters. In such a setting, it's difficult to construct a scenario wherein a truly fluid exchange of information was possible. Worse yet, there was no place Nagumo and his staff could retreat for some temporary privacy and still be in proximity to Akagi's command and communications equipment. Akagi's island was simply too small. These miserable arrangements stand in stark contrast to the facilities on board World War II American carriers, which were made possible by the American vessels having much larger islands. On each of the Yorktown-class ships there was a separate bridge for both the captain and the admiral. The ship's captain was not even allowed inside the admiral's bridge without an invitation from the flag. As such, an American admiral was free to discuss, debate or flat-out argue with his staff members behind closed doors. They were shielded from the distracting hubbub of the ship's helm and watchman, allowing them to focus strictly on the management of the battle. The admiral had a sea cabin located in the island, 
allowing him to take naps if needed in order to maintain his alertness. In addition, American admirals often had their own separate radio facilities located nearby in the island as well. All of these were luxuries Nagumo could only have dreamed of in the Spartan and completely public setting of Akagi. It should be noted, too, that during much of the morning, Akagi was either being directly attacked or was under threat of same. During these periods, the ship was frequently manoeuvring at high speeds. Nagumo had nearly been killed by a B-26 40 minutes earlier and would shortly witness several new attacks requiring additional defensive gyrations from his flagship, accompanied by combat air patrol actions and heavy anti-aircraft fire. Akagi was also conducting flight operations with some frequency. Stuck as he was in a cramped fishbowl, it's likely Nagumo spent a fair amount of his time looking out the window at these various happenings and trying to gauge their importance. In other words, the situation on the bridge was uncomfortable, noisy and distracting in the extreme. Kusaka noted that even the ship's public address system was barely audible above the din. It's hardly surprising that in such a setting, Nagumo found it difficult to reason either quickly or clearly. Nagumo's third major constraint revolved around his deck operations. A solution for Nagumo had to proceed on the basis of what was actually possible on the flight decks. Down through the years, numerous commentators on the battle have offered facile solutions for Nagumo's conundrum that have ignored these very real limitations. For instance, why could not the Japanese have moved their strike force to the flight decks and then rolled the strike aircraft forward of the crash barriers to warm up while the morning strike was recovered? Then, after recovering Tomonaga's aircraft and striking them below, why couldn't the strike aircraft, now presumably warmed up and ready for launch, be rolled back to the rear of the flight deck for spotting? The answer to questions like these is that some of these operations might have been technically possible, but the Imperial Navy had never tried doing any of them before. 8am on the 4th of June was a lousy time to try to figure out how militaries fight as they train. They absolutely have to, or they would descend into utter chaos when confronted by the enormous pressures of battle. Any attempt to monkey with fundamental activities as complex as deck operations was guaranteed to lead to confusion, wasted time, and a degraded operational tempo. This was precisely what the Japanese did not need at this time. Consequently, whatever Nagumo decided to do needed to be crafted from operational building blocks that were known commodities to the ship's crews. Finally, it must be recognised that even if there was a right solution for the situation Nagumo found himself in, odds were that it would not be easy to implement, risk-free, or even likely to forestall all of the horror and misery destined to descend on the Japanese this day. At this point in the battle, with the basic logic of the operational plan revealed as nonsense, the scouting plan in a shambles and an unforeseen enemy suddenly on their flank, there was no magic solution that was going to transform the battle's outcome. Errors in strategy as grievous as the Japanese had inflicted on themselves are rarely reversible. Instead, the best that could really be hoped for was finding an approach whereby Kido Butai had a reasonable chance of coming away with some of its carriers intact, or at least having extracted a heavy toll from the Americans. What then did Nagumo have to work with in the way of actionable information the answer is, not much. In fact, there were three worrisome aspects to Tone Number no. 4's sighting report. First, the enemy's position as given by Amari just didn't make any sense at all. If Tone No. 4 had indeed sighted American surface ships where he said he did, then he had encountered them well to the north of his appointed outbound search route. Indeed, the Americans appeared to be in the search sector of Chikuma's No. 5 search line, so why hadn't that plane spotted the Americans first? Either Amari was out of place, or the enemy force wasn't where he had reported it to be. In fact, Amari's initial report placed the Americans some 60 miles north-northeast of their actual location. Indications are that Nagumo knew that scout aircraft sometimes took great liberties when working a contact, and therefore doubted some aspects of Amari's report. Yet he had little choice but to take it at face value in terms of the reported location of the Americans. Second, Tone Number no. 4's report was miserably bereft of any indication as to what sort of American warships were out there. Ten enemy surface units, just what did that mean? 
Within minutes of the message's receipt, Nagumo sent a signal back to tone number four to ascertain the American ship types. Yet, despite the absence of positive confirmation that a carrier was with the enemy force, the presence of ten warships of any kind should have been highly suspicious. The American task force, if it could attack with aircraft, was ideally located to ambush Nagumo's carriers. Indeed, as one historian of the battle has noted, there was no point in any enemy task force being where Amari said it was, unless it could attack with aircraft. Third, upon closer examination, the fact that the enemy was steering a course of 150 degrees was ominous in itself. The prevailing winds of the morning had been from out of the southeast, although they were presently shifting around to the northeast in the area near Kido Butai. Such a course track could well be indicative of an enemy task force launching aircraft. It would seem that the significance of some or all of these clues was not lost on Nagumo and his staff. Kusaka was apparently of the opinion that there couldn't be an enemy force without carriers in the area reported. If Senshi Sosho is any indication, this appears to have been Nagumo's belief as well. However, and this is a critical point, both the Admiral and his staff came to the conclusion that whatever enemy force was out there was most probably a surface force. The Americans may have had at least one carrier in attendance with that force, but it was not viewed as a carrier force per se. Despite these ambiguities, there were several pieces of information that could be used to craft an operational plan. First, it was now clear that the Americans had a naval force in the area, and prudence would dictate that it be treated as if it contained a carrier until proven otherwise. Second, Given that Nagumo's approximate location had been known to the enemy for almost two hours, he had to assume that any enemy carrier in the neighbourhood would be in receipt of sighting reports. That meant that they could have launched against him by now. Consequently, Nagumo had every reason to expect further attacks, this time by carrier aircraft, which could arrive at any time. Third, Kido Butai's own geographic position was far from optimal. It was essentially located on the horns of a dilemma. There was no question that the horn to the northeast, the enemy naval force, was potentially the more dangerous of the two and would have to be attacked as soon as was practical. However, as part of his reaction to this new problem, Nagumo needed to consider manoeuvring his force in such a fashion as to minimise the impact of potentially being caught between two enemies. Nagumo basically had two options to try and mount an immediate attack against the newly detected American force before Tomonaga returned, or to stand pat and attack after Tomonaga had been recovered. Obviously, all things being equal, attacking sooner rather than later would generally have been preferred. However, there were numerous problems with such a course of action. First of all, Nagumo was rightly cautious about launching a strike against the enemy force, before conclusive ship identifications had been provided to him. He knew, and everyone on Akagi's bridge knew, what had happened to Rear Admiral Takagi when he had been placed in a similar situation just a month earlier. During the preliminaries at Coral Sea, the commander of Carrier Division 5 had launched a powerful group of his aircraft against an American naval target based on what had turned out to be faulty spotting information. As a result, instead of attacking a carrier, the Japanese had wasted their strength sinking an American oiler and destroyer. The second obstacle, of course, was that Nagumo had nothing in the way of strike aircraft ready to go at 7.45am. No aircraft were currently spotted on his flight decks. The spate of combat air patrol fighter landings on all four carriers from 7.30am to 7.40am is proof positive of that. For fighters to have landed at that time, the decks absolutely had to be clear astern. Thus, striking immediately could not happen in less than the time it actually took to spot, warm up and launch a strike. This meant a minimum of 45 minutes from now, that is at about 8.30am at the earliest. However, Tomonaga's returning force was expected to begin orbiting Nagumo's carriers around 8.15am, meaning that an immediate strike would need to be launched in time for the morning strike force to land. Tomonaga's group undoubtedly contained damaged aircraft and wounded airmen. They would have been airborne for almost four hours by that time, and would soon be running low on fuel, particularly on those aircraft that had suffered battle damage to their wings. It would be imperative to get them down as quickly as possible, and the carrier Hikocho would have been keenly aware of this need. As we will shortly see, 
landing the midway force, including not only the time to recover aircraft, but also the time needed afterward to clear them off of the flight deck and stow them below, was a process that could not help but take about 20 minutes per carrier. In the event, it was actually to take from around 8.37am to 9.12am to completely land Tomonaga and his men on all four carriers. The clever reader will immediately have noticed that since Tomonaga's force was not to be recovered until 9.12am in any case, could not Nagumo have anticipated this and intentionally kept Tomonaga orbiting long enough to launch a full-blown strike with all his aircraft? Working backward from a hypothetical final recovery time for Tomonaga of around 9.15am proves an illuminating exercise. If all of Tomonaga's aircraft were to be recovered by then, then they would need to start recovering by about 8.45am, or perhaps a bit later. This meant, in turn, that the reserve strike force would have to be launched and the decks clear by this time. Again, working backward, that implies an initial spotting time of about 8am at the latest for the reserve strike force, meaning that rearming would need to be complete by then as well. In other words, if Nagumo was to launch anything before Tomonaga had to come down, he had to begin his spotting almost immediately. Time was indeed a very precious commodity, by 7.45am one Chutai of Type 97s on Kaga, and Akagi had already been rearmed with 800 Keiki bombs. Had Nagumo immediately given the order to stop rearming with bombs at 7.45am, as it appears he did, he might possibly have caught the armourers in time to prevent them from beginning the switch out of the second Chutai's torpedoes. This would have allowed Carrier Division 1 to each begin spotting two of their three Chutai of torpedo-armed aircraft by about 8am. But in no case would Nagumo have been able to send up his entire reserve force of Type 97s before Tomonaga had to land the Chutai on each carrier that had already been rearmed with Type 80 bombs, simply couldn't be switched back in time. In terms of force, then, the difference between spotting now or waiting for the Kanko squadrons to be completely rearmed essentially boiled down to about 15 aircraft. If Nagumo waited, his available forces would be as follows. Akagi, 18 Kanko, 36 plane Chutai, Kaga, 26 or 27 Kanko, 3 9 plane Chutai, Hiryu, 18 Kanbaku, both of her 9 plane Chutai, Soryu, 16 Kanbaku, both of her 9 plane Chutai, total 78 or 79 attack aircraft conversely. And if Nagumo decided to spot immediately, the strike assets we can be reasonably sure were available were Akaji, 12 Kanko, two of her totals of three six-plane Chutai, Kaga, 18 Kanko, two of her totals of three nine-plane. Chutai, Hiryu, 18 Kanbaku, both of her nine-plane Chutai, Soryu, 16 Kanbaku, both of her nine-plane Chutai, total 64 attack aircraft clearly. Even without the full torpedo plane complements from Akagi and Kaga, Nagumo had the potential to launch a powerful, well-balanced strike package. The 64 attack aircraft he had available immediately were easily capable of sinking two American carriers outright if properly employed. In fact, this group of aircraft represented more than twice the aggregate firepower that the Japanese would actually manage to throw at the American carriers during the day's later actions. However, such a strike would have broken the organisational symmetry of Carrier Division 1's Kanko groups by leaving a Chutai a piece of semi-armed planes sitting in both Akagi and Kaga's hangars, a move that no doctrinaire Japanese commander would have viewed with a favourable eye. A second alternative, and one which better preserved the fleet's organisational integrity, was to go with a more limited immediate strike and just send out Carrier Division 2's 34 Kanbaku. This would have left Nagumo with another strike force in the process of arming, Carrier Division 1's Kanko, that could be launched shortly thereafter, and with Tomonaga's group to follow up later in the morning after they were recovered. The downside of this approach, though, was twofold. First, it reduced the power of the initial strike by reducing the sheer number of aircraft attacking. A second, it lowered the theoretical effectiveness of the strike by presenting the enemy with a one-dimensional threat, that is, no torpedo aircraft coming in at low altitude to stretch the enemy combat air patrol while the dive bombers attacked. Doctrine frowned on both of these sacrifices. Most likely, 
These were the only two options Nagumo and his staff considered in terms of launching an immediate attack. From the standpoint of post-war carrier operations, though, there were probably several more possibilities available to Kido Butai. If the enemy's southeast course heading was indicative of their conducting flight operations, then Kido Butai needed to consider its defensive needs as well. In light of this requirement and the technical and doctrinal imperatives at work, an approach that suggests itself is one wherein carrier divisions 1 and 2 operated independently. Fuchida suggested something similar in the post-mortem analysis of his account, where he advocated attacking with only a single carrier division at a time, while holding the other in reserve. However, it is clear that in making this suggestion, Fushida, like Nagumo and his staff, was strictly thinking in terms of how best to deliver attacks against the enemy. The fleet's defence didn't figure into Fuchida's calculus, nor apparently that of any Japanese officer this day. Admiral Yamaguchi too was opposed to operating independently for the moment, although, as we shall see, as the day wore on, his Carrier Division 2 operated in an increasingly detached manner from Carrier Division 1. A slightly different approach might have been to effect an actual split along functional lines, with one Carrier Division attending to the fleet's offensive chores, the other to the defensive. This is precisely what modern Carrier Divisions often do. This same concept, in fact, had already been cooked up by the Yokosuka Squadron, but had yet to be formally implemented in the Navy's doctrine, if such were attempted, the logical division of labour would have had Carrier Division 2 launching an immediate attack against the Americans, while Carrier Division 1 was tasked with air defence. This would have conferred a number of advantages on the Japanese. From an offensive standpoint, using only Carrier Division 2's dive bombers for an initial attack obviously meant that the force would not benefit from combined arms. Nevertheless, it placed the attack force in very capable hands. It was commonly acknowledged that Carrier Division 2's strike units were the best of the best. With the famed Commander Igusa leading the counter-strike, the Japanese could be confident of scoring against the enemy. This approach also obviated the need to shut down all of Kido Butai's flight decks simultaneously upon Tomonaga's arrival. Akagi and Kaga's strike planes could have been recovered almost immediately, thereby keeping only Hiryu's and Soryu's morning strike planes circling, while Igusa's force was spotted and launched. An even more esoteric approach might have attempted roughly the same functionalised arrangement of offensive-defensive duties, but with Soryu and Akagi designated as the combat air patrol carriers, and Hiryu and Kaga the attack carriers. In this way, a total of 36 strike aircraft, 18 Kanbaku and 18 Kanko, could be spotted immediately. In other words, this arrangement would not only split Kido Butai into two roles, but also would split the divisional structure in allocating those roles. The benefit of such an approach would be in allowing Kido Butai to launch an immediate strike package that also benefited from combined arms. However, it is clear that Nagumo and his staff were hamstrung by Japanese naval doctrine in terms of considering such options. In fact, it is unlikely that either of the functionalised approaches outlined above would have even occurred to them, particularly since the fruits of Yokosuka's research had yet to be harvested. In 1942, Japanese doctrine was strictly offensive, and its prescription for practically any tactical situation was to attack the enemy with a full-strength combined arm strike period. Nagumo's needs for a more flexible approach were therefore negated by the Imperial Navy's doctrinal emphasis on mass. In the end, as he saw it, he had only one option to attack with everything he had, regardless of how long it took to make the necessary arrangements. Regardless of the composition of the strike force, another question that needed solving was the matter of providing a fighter escort for the attack. Fuchida later asserted that providing zeros in the 8am time frame would have proven impossible, as the second wave fighters had already been sent aloft to reinforce the combat air patrol. This meant that Carrier Division 2's Kanbaku would have to go in unescorted, a prospect that no one relished. This factor has been cited by many post-war scholars as being a determining factor in Nagumo's decision. A detailed examination of Kido Butai's flight records, though, reveals an entirely different situation. As mentioned, 
The four-carrier Hikocho had anticipated Tomonaga's return and apparently tried to proactively manage the impending shutdown of the flight decks by ratcheting down the combat air patrol from about 7.30 a.m. As a result, by about 8 a.m., Kaido Butai had the following fighters available in the hangars. Akagi, 12. Kaga, 18. Hiryu, 8. Soryu, 9. For a total of 47. 35 of these zeros had been on board their respective ships for at least half an hour and could thus be reasonably assured of being fueled and munitioned. This was a powerful escort force, especially given the demonstrable superiority of Japanese fighter aircraft and pilots over their American counterparts. However, committing this body of fighters en masse to a strike against the Americans meant that Kido Butai would have almost no fighter reserve to reinforce the combat air patrol, which by now was down to just nine fighters. If Nagumo chose to launch with both Carrier Division 1 and 2, this rather pitiful combat air patrol would have to stay aloft for the duration of the spotting and launch process. Thereafter, they would need to be replenished and reinforced. Clearly the number of fighters that would escort this second strike of the morning would have to be fewer than the 36 sent out with Tomonaga. However, it is equally clear that Nagumo could have provided his force with at least some escort. Indeed, an escort of a dozen zeros could have easily been sent, and twice that many would probably not have been out of reach. The final factor Nagumo had to consider was how to manoeuvre his force. Kido Butai currently found itself between two enemies. Worse, Nagumo only really knew the location of one of these foes midway itself. Until Tone Number no. 4's position report was independently confirmed, he was dealing in vagaries as far as the American fleet was concerned. Knowing that he wanted to attack the American carrier, it made good sense to move away from Midway for the time being. Indeed, it may have even made sense to temporarily move away from the American naval force as well. In retrospect, Nagumo's subsequent decision to change course to the northeast and close the American force without first having sound knowledge of its composition and exact whereabouts was ill-conceived. It not only increased his danger from the American carriers, but it also had the effect of leaving Midway near to hand upon his southern flank. Nagumo was certainly well within his rights to manoeuvre freely. Frankly, by 8am it should have been clear to everyone on Akagi's bridge that Yamamoto's battle plan needed to be summarily consigned to the ash can. Absolutely nothing was going according to plan this morning, yet Nagumo still possessed some important advantages. For one thing, Japanese attack aircraft were somewhat longer ranged than their American counterparts. Taking a northwest course would have fulfilled his need to strike while employing his longer reach. He knew that the weather to his north wasn't good. If he could get back underneath the cold front he had come through on the previous day, he could use it to shield his movements. From there it might have been possible to work around the Americans' northern flank. Nagumo might have suspected that the Americans were covering this quadrant with their own search aircraft, as indeed they were. But at least from that direction, he could deliver attacks against them without fear of direct interference from Midway, which would be far to the south of where Nagumo would have hoped to develop the follow-on battle. Furthermore, he also could have used the time he spent manoeuvring northward to call for reinforcements, in the form of Kakuta's second mobile force, and start bringing them down from the Aleutians. Students of the battle will note that withdrawing to the north or northwest in the 8am and 9am time frame most likely would not have resulted in Kido Butai being missed altogether by the incoming American strike aircraft. Enterprise's dive bomber group eventually overhauled Kido Butai from the southwest and might also have detected a force lying directly to their north. Likewise, Kido Butai might have encountered Hornet's strike force as well. Thus, any manoeuvre Nagumo attempted in that direction would probably have exposed the fleet to a strike of some sort, however, this would potentially have had its benefits. Instead of facing attack groups from both Yorktown and Enterprise coming in simultaneously from several points on the compass, Kido Butai might have encountered these strikes sequentially and from a single direction thereby making detection and interception much easier. The Japanese combat air patrol had already demonstrated that it could deal with a single vector threat if it was given sufficient warning. However, manoeuvring in this fashion would cause problems, 
in that it necessarily meant throwing the entire operation's timetable completely off kilter. This would undoubtedly have drawn fire from Yamamoto, even if he were inclined to do so. Nagumo would have needed to begin coordinating not only the activities of his own vessels, but also helping reorient the various invasion and support forces as well. There was, in other words, a formidable level of plan inertia that would need to be overcome at an operational level. It wouldn't have been enough for Nagumo to simply radio Admiral Tanaka and say, stay where you are and I'll let you know when is safe to invade. Any hint of discarding the commander-in-chief's precious timetable would need to be backed up by mental toughness, sound logic, and the ability to supply combined fleet staff with reasonable estimates of when the job would be completed. Taking all together, and admittedly operating with the benefit of hindsight, the right answer to Nagumo's conundrum probably should have emphasised manoeuvre, offensive speed in preference to mass, and passive damage control. With 15 minutes in which to act, he didn't really have time to implement anything terribly fancy, but he could have helped himself immensely by immediately spotting every strike airplane in his hangars, whether they were armed or not, and launching them at the Americans. The 64 armed aircraft he had in hand were perfectly capable of doing enormous damage to his enemy. And by emptying his hangars, he removed the single greatest danger to his carriers, the presence of fueled and armed aircraft within them. However, even as Nagumo was considering these options, a new hurdle emerged. At 7.53am, Kirishima was seen to lay down smoke, another American air raid was coming in. As we shall see, within a matter of just a few minutes, Nagumo would be under assault yet again. Launching an attack before Tomonaga returned was now going to be doubly difficult, in that he would need to spot aircraft in the face of an ongoing American attack. No right-minded Hikocho was going to be happy spotting aircraft while the force was being bombed. With the ships engaged in high-speed manoeuvring, pushing aircraft across an exposed flight deck and into their spots would have been hideously dangerous. Plane handlers could be maimed or crushed by an aircraft that got out of control, a very real possibility if the flight deck suddenly canted to one side. In fact, one of Zuikaku's plane handlers had been killed under similar circumstances at Coral Sea, and a plane lost overboard as a result. Furthermore, having the armed and fuelled aircraft on deck directly exposed them to strafing attacks. Pressing home a spot, and then launching under such circumstances, would require both steady nerves and a steely resolve. Yet, a truly insightful commander would have pointed out to his balking captains and Hikocho that keeping armed and fuelled aircraft inside the ship during an American attack was, if anything, more dangerous than getting them airborne as quickly as possible even in the face of enemy fire. The bottom line is that Nagumo chose not to attempt an attack at this time, most likely for a host of reasons. In the first place, he probably judged that trying to shoehorn an immediate strike in before Tomonaga landed was probably going to be too difficult to deal with, particularly with a new American attack rolling in. He might also have been concerned too that Tone No. 4's position report appeared to be bogus, meaning that further scouting work would be necessary to locate the enemy. Furthermore, while we know in hindsight that the fighter situation was not as dire as Fuchida later made it out to be, both Gender and Kusaka were apparently worried about finding enough escorts for the attack force at this time. They may not have known how far along the rearming activities had progressed within Akagi's hangars, nor what the status was of the fighters aboard the other ships in Kido Butai. And while it is not documented in the available sources, it is likely that both Gender and Kusaka disliked the idea of distorting the symmetry of Kido Butai's airgroups by sending out a partial strike unit. Breaking the attack squadrons apart at this time meant trying to figure out where to integrate the remainder into strikes later in the day, if indeed the physical constraints of the force's flight decks would allow the leftovers to be spotted with Tomonaga's force later on. A partial strike now portended more mess and less efficiency later. It must be emphasised too that Nagumo's course of action was doctrinally correct. It favoured mass and held out the promise of a fully integrated strike. Right now, the choices available to Nagumo were all tough calls between various half-measures. But by waiting a bit, he might not have to make the tough choices and would be able to strike with his full force. 
Many critics of his performance, Japanese and American alike, have neglected to acknowledge that he at least acted in a fashion that was doctrinally coherent. Indeed, if Nagumo had actually been fortunate enough to attack with Kido Butai's complete reserve strike force, it would have unquestionably been the most powerful, best-coordinated strike launched by either side during the day. Unlike their American counterparts, Japanese torpedo aircraft were fully capable of delivering telling attacks. Furthermore, the Japanese were well versed in coordinating simultaneous dive bomber and torpedo strikes against moving targets. Any American flat top on the receiving end of such an assault would have found itself in the most dreadful peril. Indeed, a full strike by all four of Nagumo's flight decks had the firepower to sink every American carrier in the battle, had they been caught operating in proximity. However, the most important factor is that Nagumo probably felt little real urgency to strike at this moment. Hitting the American task force was clearly the highest priority mission at hand. Having only sighted ten warships, though, he apparently judged the enemy to be rather weak. Indeed, it was possible, albeit unlikely, that a stray American carrier had simply been in the area, delivering aircraft or some such, and had moved toward Midway as a result of the actions on 3 June. No matter where it came from, there were no real indications at the moment that Kido Butai would have any problem attacking it in due time. Given the very real difficulties inherent in trying to put together a strike force before Tomonaga's imminent homecoming, the path of least resistance was simply to accept the slight delay in counter-attacking. Nagumo would use the time gained during recovery operations to complete the rearming of Carrier Division 1's Kanko and then launch a full-blown strike force later in the morning. This perception of American weakness clearly influenced his subsequent decision to close the enemy. Indeed, before the strength of American air power made itself calamitously known, Nagumo would issue orders to his fleet at 9.30am that his intention was to destroy the enemy in a daylight engagement, in other words, a surface action. Apparently, Nagumo judged the American fleet to be weak enough that, if need be, he could dispatch it with his own rather light screening forces, albeit stiffened by two fast battleships. Such an order would telegraph the unconscious message to the Japanese forces that there was no need to wait until after dark to employ the Imperial Navy's vaunted night battle techniques against this particular enemy. They could be mopped up right now, in broad daylight. Thus, for the next three hours, Nagumo treated this force as an enemy that was first to be attacked by the air, and then annihilated by his destroyers and battleships on the surface. Much like his earlier decision to authorise attacking Midway with his reserve aircraft, Nagumo's decision to delay attacking the American task force has been mercilessly criticised. Fuchida remarked, Looking back on this critical moment, which ultimately was to decide the battle, I can easily realise what a difficult choice faced the force commander, yet even now I find it hard to justify the decision he took. Should he not have sacrificed every other consideration in favour of sending the dive bombers immediately against the enemy ships? Should he not have dispatched the torpedo bombers also, even though armed with bombs? He could have launched them to orbit until enough fighters could be recovered, refuelled and launched again to provide escort. The planes back from Midway could have been kept in the air at least until the bombers had cleared. Damaged planes, if unable to remain aloft any longer, could have crash-landed in the sea where destroyers would have rescued the crews. Wise after the event, the saying goes, still, there is no question that it would have been wiser to launch our dive bombers immediately, even without fighter protection. In such all-or-nothing carrier warfare, no other choice was admissible. Even the risk of sending unprotected level bombers should have been accepted as necessary in this emergency. Their fate would probably have been the same as that of the unescorted American planes which had attacked us a short while before, but just possibly they might have saved us from the catastrophe we were about to suffer. Fuchida's comments require careful analysis, because they contain important grains of truth, but also some stunning misstatements. Fuchida was correct to say that, if at all possible, it was desirable to attack the Americans quickly. This was clearly a time when the book needed to be tossed aside in favour of haste. He was also right in pointing out that the fewer planes in the hangars, the better. Whether Fuchida truly apprehended this during the battle, or only upon reflection afterward, 
the truth remains that the best thing that Nagumo could have done to augment his force's survivability was to get as many aircraft out of his hangars and up in the air as possible. Whether they had anything useful to do up there or not, Fuchida was wrong, however, on three crucial points. First, of course, was his deliberate neglect to mention that Nagumo could actually launch nothing at 7.45 a.m., because all of the force's reserve strike aircraft were in the hangars. Second, whatever the need for a speedy attack, that imperative absolutely had to be balanced against the need to preserve the combat power of the force as a whole. In other words, Nagumo needed to minimise unnecessary losses, through deliberate ditchings and so on, among Tomonaga's force, if at all possible. Kido Butai was now confronted by not one, but two enemies without aircraft. Nagumo's carriers could neither attack nor defend themselves. Responding to a suddenly augmented estimate of enemy firepower, with a knee-jerk reaction that deliberately subtracted from one's own inventory of this vital commodity, hardly made good sense. In a war that was to be filled with examples of needless sacrifices of Japanese forces, Nagumo is to be applauded for electing top reserve Tomonaga's assets at this juncture, rather than simply squandering them. Instead, he has been unfairly pilloried for his prudence. However, the most important criticism of Fuchida's comments stems from his ignoring a vital piece of information that his post-war account should have had ready to hand. What Fuchida almost certainly knew in 1951, but Nagumo could only suspect on 4 June 1942, was that even as the commander of Kidobutai was mulling his options on the bridge of Akagi, the bulk of the American carrier aircraft that would ultimately destroy his force were either already taking to the air or were shortly to do so. In a nutshell, whether or not Nagumo launched a counter-strike before Tomonaga returned, he was still likely to be on the receiving end of a very heavy American attack at some point in the morning. It will be recalled that Admiral Fletcher had ordered Spruance to attack the Japanese as soon as practicable, and Spruance had duly headed southwest to close on Kido Butai's reported position. He had set 7 a.m. as the time to launch both Hornets and Enterprises airgroups, and precisely at the appointed hour they had begun doing so. However, their subsequent flight operations were notable for a lack of coordination and poor organisation. No plan was in place to use the two carriers' airgroups en masse. Rather, American doctrine dictated that each carrier's group was an independent entity. Furthermore, Spruance's air advisor, Commander Miles R. Browning, neglected to issue detailed instructions to Hornet, thus leaving it to her skipper, Captain Marker Mitcher, to issue orders to his airgroup as to their outbound route. Furthermore, the method by which the two American carriers spotted their respective strike forces was left strictly up to their captains as well. Both skippers understandably wished to strike with every attack plane at their disposal. However, given the number of aircraft they would send up, they would need to first launch one portion of the strike, report the decks, and then launch the remainder. During the reporting process, the aircraft already aloft would need to circle overhead, waiting for the complete strike to come up. Captain George D. Murray, Enterprise's skipper, chose to send up combat air patrol fighters and his longer-ranged scout bomber Douglases in his first spot, followed by his shorter-ranged fighters and torpedo bomber Douglases in the second package. This plan made a good deal of sense, in that it kept the shorter-ranged aircraft on deck until last, thus providing them with the best possible amount of actual flying time toward the objective. In the event, though, because of mechanical issues and other problems, Enterprise took an immensely long time to spot her second deck load after the first was launched. Furthermore, in the middle of the protracted spot, Task Force 16 had become aware of Tone No. 4's presence in the form of its intercepted 7.40 a.m. transmission to Nagumo, which to Enterprise's radio intelligence officer looked conspicuously like a sighting report. Desperate to get things moving, Spruance informed Enterprise's dive bombers to proceed on their assigned mission without waiting for the follow-up fighter escort or torpedo bomber Douglases. Worse yet, when these second-wave aircraft were finally launched, they chose a different outbound route from the dive bombers. Thus, Enterprise's strike had already been split into two components, each of which was proceeding independently. Hornet's performance was even worse. Captain Mitcher, despite his experience, 
inexplicably decided to position his fighters in the front half of his first spot, followed by the scout bomber Douglases and then half of the torpedo bomber Douglases. Once these aircraft were aloft, the remainder of the torpedo planes would be spotted and launched. Forty-five minutes later, this is exactly what had transpired, leaving the fighters with just that much less combat radius. Hornet strike departed at 7.55 a.m. The subsequent movements of Hornet's airgroup remain somewhat mysterious to this day. Some accounts maintain that the airgroup commander, Lieutenant Commander Stanhope C. Ring, flew a southwest course after being launched and thereby ultimately missed Kido Butai by flying to the south of it. However, we hew to the interpretation that Hornet's group actually flew almost due west from their launch point and thereby flew to the north of Nagumo. Why Ring made the decision to take his group west rather than southwest toward the location of the initial PBY spotting reports remains unclear, but the result was that only a single squadron of Hornet's air group would ultimately get into the fight this morning and then only as the result of the most bizarre circumstances. The contrast between these rather benighted deck operations and those of the Japanese could not be more striking, whereas Tomonaga's 108 aircraft had taken just seven minutes to send aloft. Hornet and Enterprise laboured for an hour to launch their own strikes, which totalled only eight aircraft more 20 fighters, 68 dive bombers and 29 torpedo aircraft for a total of 117. Not only that, but instead of getting a coordinated strike from their two carriers, they had gotten three separate air groups heading in three different directions. As events transpired, some of the aircraft that set off together would not stay together long, leading to a further dispersion of power. Thus, the American aircraft, even if they reached the Japanese fleet at all, would be forced to attack in squadron-sized parcels. Nevertheless, by around 8 a.m., the fates of Nagumo and Kido Butai were already sealed to a certain degree. The Americans had a fairly good idea of where the Japanese lay, and they had managed to put enough firepower in the air to be reasonably assured of causing the Japanese force great harm if they could find Kido Butai. This fact places the questions surrounding Nagumo's options in a completely different light. Whether Kido Butai struck back before or immediately after Tomonaga came home to roost, the Americans had still taken the initiative away from the Japanese. If Nagumo was to have attacked the Americans in time to forestall their strikes against him, he needed information from Tone Number 4 or somebody else much earlier in the morning. In fact, working backward from when the American carriers launched their respective strikes, it is possible to determine when spotting information ceased to be actionable in a preemptive sense, the slowest Japanese strike aircraft, the Type 97 Kanko, cruised at 138 knots. They would take about an hour and a half to cover the roughly 200 miles to the American task force. But in the best of circumstances, attacking even the Yorktown, which, as we shall see, would start sending her own planes aloft at 8.38 a.m., meant that Nagumo would have had to have his own aircraft in the air by around 7.15 a.m. in order to hit the Americans first. That, in turn, means that Nagumo needed to have begun spotting his strike no later than 6.30 a.m. Worse yet, hitting Enterprise and Hornet before they began launching would have required having a strike in the air no later than 5.30 a.m. Thus, by the 7.45 a.m. to 8 a.m. time period, when Nagumo was actually debating the information he had in his hands, the Americans could no longer be forestalled. Nothing Nagumo could do at this point could entirely unmake the morning's events. This, in turn, shifts a hefty share of the day's blame away from Tone No. 4 and onto Chikuma's No. 1 aircraft, which had flown the No. 5 search line. As bad as Petty Officer Amari's subsequent navigation would prove, the critical reconnaissance failure really lay here. Chikuma No. 1 was the only plane that could have gotten timely information into Nagumo's hands. Had this plane flown its route correctly and closer to the surface, it almost certainly should have detected the American task force between 6.15 a.m. and 6.30 a.m., that is, within the time frame, barely needed to act decisively. Its failure cost Nagumo more than an hour of reaction time. It was this failure, not Tone No. 4's late launch, that set in motion a veritable avalanche of negative tactical consequences. 
Chikuma No. 1's gaff was indicative of a larger failure, however, for it was here that the paltry number of aircraft devoted to the morning search really hurt Nagumo's chances. No properly conceived search program should have been completely compromised by the failure of a single asset. There should have been more aircraft devoted to the search. Some would point to Chikuma No. 1's inability to sight the Americans as somehow supporting the notion that the weather was so bad on Nagumo's eastern flank that no number of additional scouting assets in the area would have rectified the situation. However, this makes no sense. The failure of one scout plane in one location, for whatever reasons of local weather conditions, poor navigation, and improper scouting technique says nothing about the odds of another nearby plane in slightly different weather, with different sight lines, and performing its search in a disciplined manner to detect the same enemy. There can be no denying that more search assets would have significantly bettered Nagumo's odds. But Japanese doctrine and its offensive-minded outlook precluded this. As it was, gender's reconnaissance scheme was essentially a roll of the dice, and Nagumo had crapped out hours ago.